Okay. Um, so the uh, welcome everyone to the wallet development. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> this isn't wallet. This is the adaptive. Welcome to the DAP developer working group. Hey. For Tuesday, April seventh. Now we had an exciting morning uh, in the wallet thing with staking pools, tokens, voting, and sharding topics. Yeah. Um, I just posted the video on that. I'll try to watch that. Yeah. Hey, Gary. Hey. So uh, uh, the, the focus today is supposed to be on the voting app. And this is uh, uh, the voting app will be used for the Archain Co-op voting in the member, uh, in the annual member meeting, right? <laughs> That's what we're doing. Um, uh, okay, so I, um, we want this to run on our chain. It has to be anonymous voting. Has to, um, it employs the email address identities. That's uh, our chain members are emails, email addresses right now. Okay. Okay. Um, and um, And we have uh, yes, no, abstain questions. Okay, uh, and we have uh, other question types. Text, rank, estimate, okay, um, Tally. Decisions 
by percentages about medians So, I mean, this could be uh, majority, two thirds, whatever. Hey Theo. Hello. Here, let me. Um, I'm gonna paste in the chat the document we're working on. Hey Patrick, welcome. Hi. Hey Patrick and Theo. Just to catch everyone up, we're. Um, we're working on work. Uh, so it was discussed during the last here. Let me, am I still sharing? No, oh, I stopped sharing for some reason. Um, uh, during the last governance meeting, we discussed um, creating a R chain voting DAP to be used for the October co-op member uh, annual meeting to, to use to, to vote for uh, board of directors and a vote for items of business. So in previous years, we've used the third party voting application, which has worked fine. Uh, but now that we're at mainnet and uh, we can, we have uh, compute power. Uh, the goal is to uh, create something of our own. So Jim has, created, uh, been working on voting for several months. Um, so now we, in, in different capacities, what happened to the screen here? For many, many, many years since the, uh, uh, the late seventies. <laughs> oh, okay. I didn't realize that. So Jim's been working on voting for quite, quite some time. Life so, uh, work. yeah. And so, uh, hopefully you guys can see the, uh, have access to the links that um, that I put into the chat, but essentially, and it's also in Discord. It's um, so right now we're doing requirements gathering. So I'll share my screen, and th these are um, uh, we're kind of uh, documenting uh, our discussions from previous uh, previous discussions. We've been discussing a voting application DAP for months and months, but we've never actually sat down and um, hammered anything out like what we're doing now as far as putting down the requirements. So uh, this is kind of the, the repository for all the ideas up to this point. Okay. I don't. I don't know about requirement two and three. Like, how can you make it anonymous and then also use email? Right. And um, you know, I basically uh, basically the same method we've been using for the last couple of years. But instead of using a service, we will be using our chain uh, to collect the votes. 
And uh, the method that I've outlined here um, is that you know, we generate random tickets and we distribute the tickets randomly to the co-op members. Okay. Okay. Um, and of course, that's a matter of trust. I mean, we can, we can watch uh, Ian or someone do it, you know, on a video or something to see that it was done fairly or whatever. Of course, you don't want to see a log that actually identified anyone. Um, and then uh, you have the votes on our chain so that you can, you can know that your ticket matches your votes. So each person knows what their ticket was and what their votes were, but nobody knows who belongs to what ticket. Um, and uh, the election app, okay, you know, might validate users with Discord or whatever using OAuth too. Uh, or it might not validate them at all. It may just take a ticket and um, validate the ticket that it's one of the thousand tickets for voters. And it set, you know, sets or updates the person's votes. Um, and then we have a, uh, a, a contract that tallies the results. And I, you know, I did, oh, kind of want to separate that because we might want to tally them in different ways. We just want to have the data there of the random uh, tickets and results. Um, then uh, we, in order to, uh, get, uh, you know, we can give the results, okay. It's a question of how we make the decisions. Um, when we're making estimates, usually medians are the best uh, result. And of course, you know, rank ordering is good, but we're not going to do that right away. <laughs> rank ordering is one of the first interfaces I built way back when. So uh, the, the uh, um, I mean, where we sort of left off was that, you know, we need a development team. And uh, I'm willing to uh, help guide, but uh, we're looking for people who are, who want to learn and are interested in, uh, in building apps apps to uh, man the project. And did we, didn't we get a list of people that were interested? I think we got Gary, myself. I think we got, did we get you, Theo? <laughs> yeah, I can, can help with whatever. <laughs> no, no issue. Okay, and then of course we got Steve. Steve is organizing this. And he's talking about uh, gathering requirements today. I quite like to use this as an opportunity to learn Rolang, if that's awesome. possible. Um, I don't know if I would hold you back or add any value as a developer at this point. It's it. Well, you know, I, I, sometimes I, I, just having another pair of eyes looking at it is helpful. So okay. You no, know, for live coding sessions, <laughs> you know, while you're learning, um, you know, you, uh, you, uh, yeah, just you, um, you know, you notice when somebody misspells a variable, yeah, right? Yeah, I was just going to say typos and things like that. It's, and that's what I've been doing. Um, up till now is just I'm not a programmer and I don't know Rolang, but just sitting in on the sessions and you, you slowly you start to piece things together. Um, and you know, you, you certainly check typos. And when you start to do that, you realize, hey, I, I actually know something. But um, yeah, and there's I other mean, Rolang is an, is, is 
a a a uh, 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 amazingly simple language. I mean, it all you all you have is is you know uh, pro processes in parallel sent to names or channels. Okay, that's, so it. that's all there is. <laughs> if, I, if I can learn Python and JavaScript, I can learn Rulang. Yeah, it's it, it's almost too simple. You know, it bends your mind. Okay. Just how to apply it to real life scenarios, like that's how I feel at least. Like you know, you don't know where to start if you have like a problem to solve and you have right. rolling, and you yeah. have to like think think in terms of rolling. How how do you? Yeah program it like a process, like a set of processes that communicate with each other. Right. In the real world applications, I'd like to introduce my friend and colleague, James Jones, who's jumped on the call. Hi, James. Hello. Pleasure Gmail. to meet you. Nice it's to meet a, you. It's a virtually meeting. <laughs> yes, indeed. James, do you want to give some background on yourself and what you're doing? Um, well, I'll, I'll skip the self part <laughs> and get to what I'm doing. So okay. I'm building a set of uh, small scale machines that fit together to be a uh, mini factory. And the premise is that uh, you can put these anywhere and sort of, uh, it's distributed manufacturing. Um, the financial industry is enormous, and that got everybody excited. And cryptos, uh, manufacturing is about three times as big. Uh, so the idea of putting, uh, adding blockchain to this at some point was always in the plan. And for the most part, the premise is that by distributing manufacturing, you make very so short supply chains and therefore highly resilient manufacturing, and you eliminate an enormous hundreds of millions of tons of carbon. There are a whole bunch of uh, details regarding this system that I could go at on at indefinite length, so I won't. <laughs> okay, well, I'll just uh, tail that by saying, today, James, uh, we're talking about building a decentralized voting app, which right. I think in terms of your vision for Cube Spawn, having a bunch of uh, local manufacturing cooperatives or uh, um, kind of cooperative Amazons uh, that recycle their material in this, what, what do you call it? This like a circular economy model. Right. Everything local. So we're, so in terms of this kind of DAO governance and decentralized governance, I think that's really useful. And in terms of how Rolang, the, the coding language itself works, um, it's, uh, Jim, how did you describe it? It's sending messages along channels. And yeah. it's about doing things um, in uh, concurrently, in parallel. Yeah, the, so, it's, it's, as, it's as simple as a system can get. It, it sends and receives uh, messages or... Uh, okay. Uh, well, that's, pattern patterns. <laughs> that's exactly what you do in robotics. And I, and I think that we, with uh, why I'm excited to get CubeSpawn involved is if we're talking about global coordination of manufacturing capacity um, and starting again from scratch, um, I, I definitely think Roland could be a superb performance um, enterprise ready uh, language for, um, pro for programming robots. Basically. Well, and, yeah. and I am very, very weakly familiar with Erlang because uh, I had a friend who was really into it. So I have a little bit of a system concept uh, of the inspiration for that. Uh, nice. Although I have to say I know nothing about Rolang at this point. Uh, yeah. But I presume that there's a similarity because concurrency and producing messages without uh, Processing messages and producing output are the two main things. It doesn't really, there's really no synchronization between elements. It's simply that they act on each other's output. Right. And, uh, you know, you can send messages, you can receive messages. In Roland, you can also join, the, you know, where 
simultaneously A receives B and uh, X receives Y and blah, you know, blah, blah. So, right. Uh, so that's where we get our synchronization. And in, in a receive, we can re do a join. And and my under that's about it. It's so my understanding is that Erlang uses the actor model and Rolang uses the pi calculus, and they're very they're very related. I mean, they they attempt to do pretty much the same thing as far as concurrency. Right, but only uh, only uh, Rolang programs are constrained. By the process calculus, of course, you know, uh, uh, you want to uh, control roll, uh, roll so special sauce. I think that's as much as you need to understand now, James. Right. It's like there's some special sauce in it, and it's going to come out in the wash when you kind of see what it's capable of doing. The other yeah. things are right. right. Well, anything that'll do a great deal of synchronization between all of these different systems is useful because. You know, a job gets submitted to one system that has 10,000 parts, but there are only materials for 3,000, so it's going to get distributed to a nearby system for the other 7,000, or possibly spread across multiple systems, and then feedback for information on failures and uh, so on, so that rescheduling can occur dynamically and, and in real time is a potential place where this could end up. So, uh, you know, the ability to synchronize complex processes across multiple uh, discrete systems in a, in a region is a valuable, no matter how you accomplish it. <laughs> so this is a, this sounds like the right tool. Yeah, on Friday, they have a uh, um, climate and coordination um, our chain meeting that Greg usually attends. Um, uh, uh, they're all about, you know, coordination technologies, and uh, uh, I think they would be really interested in what you have to see. I, I you, could, could you accompany James on that call? Because if Greg's on it, I, I probably don't want to. But uh, would, would, is that okay? Yeah, yeah, sure. I can attend on Friday. Okay. Awesome. Cool. Right. Well, you get that out of the way, let's talk about building a decentralized voting app. I'm super excited to learn. <laughs> All right, well, um, it looks like between uh, Steve and I, we've we got it all laid out here. <laughs> um, uh, and today we're supposed to complete requirements gathering and what we have so far is runs on our chain um, anonymous voting um, plus email address call our chain identities that's what our chain identities define currently as is uh, an email address that you use when you sign up so uh, most of our questions will be yes, no, abstain type questions. Uh, if we have that, it's probably good enough to be used in October. But it shouldn't be hard to have more than that. Um, text input, uh, rank, estimate, uh, let's say, uh, Alternative. You know, where you where you choose from a list of alternatives, whatever. Um, Voter interface is probably going to be the hardest part. Like you well, have to convince people to actually go in there and vote using the app or web browser or whatever. Yeah. Well, one of the problems that we know that we had, had had was if the if the if the user deploys it would be easy for the user to deploy their votes along with their ticket to the to the, to the system but then it, but then they'd be giving in they, they'd be giving up their identity you know 
their identity would then be uh, determined. Uh, it wouldn't be anonymous anymore because they would have to sign the deploy with some but some account that had uh, rev in it, and uh, that could be in principle traced back to you. So uh, what we figured is you, there would have to be you would, there would have to be some app, you know, that you would come to, and you know it would probably be a hacked up version of this uh, client where you would put in your vote. And, uh, uh, but uh, uh, it would um, send, uh, it would sign the transaction with the uh, private key of the election. So that the it would you know it would verify the ticket for the user is a valid ticket. So there it would call, you know it would basically uh, check to see if that ticket existed. And uh, what that if that person had already voted, what their current vote is. Votes are. And. Uh, But that's the problem. The problem is if, if, the, if the user deploys it with their own private key, then uh, they uh, uh, they expose themselves. So we can have a, uh, uh, I mean, basically just have a, a simple app that um, just has the, uh, the the key for the election that uh, verifies the user, maybe does a Discord OAuth 2 login uh, or can just trust if they have a valid ticket, they're valid. So um, you don't want to let them sign messages, right? And upload it to, to the chain for privacy. Right. It means, you know, for now, that's one of the things that we realized is that, you know, we, we need, you know, we were talking today about having um, personal nodes or personal shards where we have all our private information and then having uh, the ability to deploy to names that are on another shard or on mainnet. Um, pretty cool. Uh, 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 so, check, so, check rather, out the, check out so the rather than a mailbox, you're going to give everybody their own shard. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's basically it. Why not? And you know, and Tom, uh, Thomas Love was saying, you know, like with the save last state, they you know they can keep the database really small. How are you doing, ID proxies? I didn't hear that. Uh, you're you're doing an ID proxy. You have a verified ID that has a verified sub ID that, but the sub ID can be anonymous in application, even though it's uh, generated from a known agent. Yes, that's the idea. All right. Well. Um, so you could have multiple verified IDs for different environments. You'd have one core ID that was the real person, and then you'd have all these ID proxies for interacting with different systems in a verifiable way that wasn't, didn't personally reveal you. Right. And so, you know, are you with it, looking at it in terms of an object capability model and you know, if we give you the capability to vote, uh, that uh, uh, having that capability means that connects you to the Archain co-op. You know, so your uh, capabilities and identity are, are are linked. Right. 
Yes. Object. object capabilities are some interesting back breeding for you, James. Okay. That's something that's very special about our chain. It's one of the things. And um, if anyone has any good links or background reading on what makes object capabilities so super special, um, that would be good. The best, the best references on, on object capabilities are Mark Miller's videos. And I think this is it. I haven't found any written material that, that helped me too much, but his, his uh, videos are good. Uh, Mark Miller, and then what would what topic again? Oh, I'll get it. Object capabilities. Object capabilities. Okay, I'll look that up. Yeah. Yeah. And, it's, and then and then on top of object capabilities, we get the electronic rights transfer protocol. Okay. And these these things are are at two different layers. Uh, Jim can tell you more about that than, than I can. So there's uh, one video. So Mark Miller is involved with a project called Agoric, or that's his company. And so it's, you know, it's, a, it's Agoric isn't necessarily a blockchain. So they're uh, pairing up with a blockchain called Cosmos. But you think of Agoric, they're a, a platform for creating smart contracts. So that's... Uh, and let's see here. Yeah, I think that's the video. It's a, it's a, um, Fair yeah. Missing, not seeing the videos I'm looking for. Yeah, I have, I, I have the most trouble finding what I want in there because the videos that, that work the best for me are very long and I can never find the part that uh, DC Casey showed us. Yeah, and it's it's right where he starts talking about uh, the the VAT, the value added transactions or something like. Let me see I if agree. I can find find that. Let me skim through. So then that raises another question: Are you gonna you're gonna do this on mobile devices? Um, yeah. Um, I mean, I. We probably, uh, uh, we may, uh, we probably won't have uh, uh, native uh, native apps, uh, but we, you know, we have single page JavaScript apps. We could, we could make an app out of them. I was just curious if you're going to make use of T, the trend, uh, trusted execution environment that's on our uh, ARM processors. Uh, I don't know. That would be uh... probably not for now. No. <laughs> but there's right. one. Right. You know, the, for now, uh, we just uh, uh, disassociate the t the uh, tickets from the from uh, the user, and of course, you know, there's always a way to trace things back. Um, should be a, you know what IP address they sent it from or whatever, but um, we can make it pretty we can make it pretty pretty anonymous and uh, what onion gateway they exited through. <laughs> but there's two things, James, that um, our chain has already or will have very soon. And one is a direct Godot game engine integration, which is Theo is building. And the other is a browser for decentralized applications, which a chap called Raphael is building, which plugs straight into our chain as well. So, and we're already starting to be on a level with like what Ethereum can do. Um, but in obviously not like totally decentralized like Ethereum, but for example, our chain can store data on, on chain. 
whereas Ethereum can't, or it's very, it's prohibitively expensive to do so and difficult. So, you know, there's like, it's it, in terms of what you're trying to do with CubeSpawn, um, or, well, you know, we're already building CubeSpawn Maker on top of our chain. Uh, you know, I just, I think um, there's a bunch of things that could be food for thought for you. Our, our, right, I'll dig into the environment, get a little bit more informed because of course, you know, it's always this way in the beginning, you're clueless when you start out. <clears throat> and if uh, a voting system actually pertains to a whole bunch of things because uh, on, you know, we've discussed the uh, AR, VR interface and capturing AR, data so that that data can be used then to train models to allow for maintenance. And if you have a voting system, one of the things is to allow uh, the machines to actually vote on whether something is beneficial based on quantifiable characteristics. So if something makes the process shorter, that's a quantifiable characteristic. The machines can vote in favor of a particular modification. There are a whole bunch of things. So voting systems, I understand the relevance to the system. Or I've already I've explored that way back at the beginning of Ethereum. I explored that because a lot of people were talking about voting systems then. So, and well, voting systems work by similar rules, irrespective of which systems it's being deployed on. So I have some familiarity with those that premise. Sorry. Yeah. The, uh, well, on our chain, I think a lot of false promises were made with respect to Ethereum. And are still being made but with our chain because of the way it's built um it has this correct by construction property as well so i don't know how far along the line we are with that jim but maybe you could give some insight is that if the um code doesn't execute what it's supposed to it just doesn't compile and it doesn't run so you you don't end up with the security issues and um exploits that you end up with ethereum where you couldn't no democracy would ever really trust Ethereum to manage voting on because you, no matter how much you QA it, you can never assure that it's going to run as intended. Um, but Jim, I, I, I'm not sure how. Well, there's how, a couple of things. A couple of things there. One is one is by 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 having the system formally conform to process calculus, the behavior of asynchronous communicating processes can be determined. Whereas in systems built with, you know, a lambda calculus model or uh, like a Turing machine or like Ethereum, there's no guarantee what order this, the processor are gonna work in the system. Our chain makes it clear, you know, makes it, 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 it definable. Uh, it doesn't make it easy necessarily. And uh, the thing that makes it easier is that we solve these hard problems and then we can use solutions of different problems in a composable way to build another thing that we know is going to be secure. And um, because uh, uh, we have uh, uh, it, it, not in this version of our chain now, which is Mercury, but in Venus, we have this behavioral typing where we actually, would, and this is what we're talking about, you define the behavior of the system. And if it, the system doesn't conform to that, isn't going to conform to that behavior, it won't compile. And this includes things like, will the system ever deadlock? Well, you just program in, you know, the requirement that there's no deadlocks and it won't compile if it can deadlock, for example. So in terms of ordering, and in terms of like engineering performance, um, I think you know you're in the right place, James. And they're and we're building the components now to do what right. you wanted. Whereas perhaps with Ethereum, you were pulling a lot for these components for your vision, but no one could really give them to you. But here we are now building a voting system, and we'll be building other things. So well, the potential existed for prototyping, but there was no guarantee that it would work, uh, that it would be mission capable. So, you know, you can prototype, you can prototype stuff that kind of works the way you want it to. Uh, and that was, Ethereum was a good enough for that. But uh, if it comes down to mission critical stuff, 
I'm trying to find the name of the language that they use in aerospace that's evaluated mathematically, and I'm, that's got to be parallel to this. Uh, it's used a lot on flight control systems, but I can't. The guy who wrote it is actually a mathematician, and it's <clears throat> it's taken. Uh, nobody has adopted it outside of aerospace because it's too complex. <laughs> Well, except our team has adopted the principles of it, it seems. And the, right. Yeah. So well, I, look, I look forward to digging in on that. I may not be smart enough to understand the solution, but that's okay. Because uh, if somebody else is working on it and they uh, understand it well enough to implement it, then we're on our way. Yeah, I'll try and find this other language because I'll look at that too because that's that is like the gold standard in evaluation of uh, Again, it won't compile unless it does what exactly what it's supposed to. In fact, it doesn't it doesn't uh, Work that way. It won't evaluate It's a pre-compiler stage. It won't evaluate the terms won't evaluate if it doesn't work <laughs> I'm sure there's similar logic involved well, uh, so uh, then we have the uh, timeline, and the only thing we have on here is a uh, target of August 1st to complete the app, and, and that basically gives us August, September, and October to play with it. <laughs> Um, I think, you know, we can have a proof of concept sooner. I mean, we could have it almost immediately. I don't know. Any uh, thoughts on this? What would be our, um, what would be our immediate action items that we would want to have for like next week or? Uh, well, I think Jim, I know you, with all the, the voting related work that you've been doing. Um, so do we want to have a repository on the Archain community on, on GitHub that's for this voting app, or do we want to use your GitHub repository as the central storage? Um, yeah, I think uh, Archain community would be a good place. Okay. So perhaps we should create a, um, uh, uh, a repository called voting and then migrate everything that we've done voting wise uh, over to that repository. And, uh, and that's, that's a good idea because uh, the, uh, the stuff needs to be reorganized anyway. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, Dan put the, uh, the, the uh, OAuth 2 stuff in, uh, uh, in with the, uh, bounty system uh, php code all right so we gotta i uh, i don't know how we move that out i guess we just have to i don't know if there's mm. any way does anybody know if there's a way we in github we can move a directory from one repository to another <laughs> yeah i'm not familiar enough with github to uh to make any suggestions but i mean among us we have lots of people who are more than certainly more comfortable so we can ask you know Dan he 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 would be able to help us I would imagine voting description uh, okay yeah there we go uh, that's too long public do we want to uh, create the readme or we don't care uh yeah it's always good to have that you know for people to there at least for me i'm used to seeing the readme and we can use that to elaborate on well the the readme that's where we can put this um this draft document we're creating in 
in Google Docs is we can do the uh, uh, markup. Uh, hey, mark I'm sorry, Jim, I found a five-step process for trans transferring a repository. Do you want to look at it? For uh, uh, moving a directory. Oh. Not the whole repository. Just okay, repository. never mind. Yeah, so the, the, the README will be the document that we're working on in Google Docs. So we'll do the, uh, the add-ons, uh, uh, the uh, hypertext markup language out, copy and paste it, and, and put it into the README docs. What, what uh, license do we want? I forget. Uh, well, this is open source, right? So open yeah, for everyone. Open source. So MIT is typically the open source. Yeah, M MIT is. Okay, and then we create the repository. And um, let me. Uh, Didn't I create a? What? Read yeah. Me? What happened to the README? I don't know. It's easy enough to create it. Um, and we can. Uh, I can just take this and uh, I can uh, do a uh, add-ons. Yeah. Box to markdown convert. Uh, what? Markdown. Uh, just curious, uh, the focus on a programming or a uh, voting app at this point in time, is that relative to an actual election that you're trying to get connected to or? Yeah, yeah. the, the, uh, the co-op member voting in October. Okay. It's our annual meeting. Our annual members meeting. Where we formally um, make decisions as a membership. Gotcha. Okay, so this uh, add-on for Google Docs to, to mark down uh, Looks really nice, doesn't it? Yeah, it does look good. Oh, <laughs> well, I should update that. But basically, we just replaced the whole thing. We're working here at some point, and uh, uh, oh, changing community voting. Oh. Okay, I got to jump off for another meeting. Uh, James, it was a pleasure meeting you. And it was uh, brief but intense. Yeah, <laughs> look forward to yeah uh, chatting with you again real soon. Okay, so, sounds good. Uh, yep, have a great day, everybody. Bye, Steve. Okay. Any uh, more action items? Um, Leo, Gary, anybody uh, uh, want to take some activity with respect to voting for next week? Do I, don't I know have some right access to the repos repository? I don't think I have any. Uh, no. Like how do I contribute? Do I with PR requests? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I guess where we're going to talk is. I think we should be talking. I don't know what uh, Steve said, but uh, um, the uh, we can use the govern governance uh, channel in the collab. Uh, to coordinate and uh, uh, I mean you can direct message me uh, to be added to the repository.
once I know what I can contribute with, then I will ask. Like I can pr probably make the that web application in JavaScript make it like into a React app that React Native app that you can deploy for mobile as well to make it easier yeah. for users well, to vote. Yeah, we have. Uh, whoops, we have the uh, changes made are not saved. I didn't save them. Commit new file. Um, blockchain community. Okay, so the B, the blockchain, the uh, R R R chain DBR. Share your screen, Jim. Oh. Where is it? Um. Uh, our chain DBR, that's the bounty system. Okay, within the bounty system is uh, OAuth 2 to our chain. Okay, this is the stuff that Dan did on identity you know, for uh, our chain users to log in. Okay, that's not the email thing stuff. But it's just part of what we need to uh, get for certainly for voting with robot. You know, that will be in Discord. So we need to be able to associate a rev address with a Discord ID. And that's what this mm -hmm. is about. Upload files. No, I want to download files. So I want this whole directory. Yeah, I don't think you can. You have to download it all manually. Okay, so and then push as a commit. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna see if I put that together. I I don't know if it's worth everyone sticking around for that. If they want to see me fuck, play with GitHub, they... <laughs> uh, I kind of wish that in GitHub you can put a dependency, like a folder dependency, to another project, but you don't you can't, unfortunately. You have to copy it all manually. You Which can't just is fork it in the other one? You, I'm sorry. You can't just fork it to the other to the other repository or to the other account. No, you have to pull it then push it. I'm afraid. The problem is it's you know it's it's only one directory in the project. Okay, so. Um, Okay, well, I'm gonna check out, guys. Um, which channel is this stamp developer stuff associated with on the collab? Uh, uh, we should make it in governance. Okay, great. Governance. I'll stay informed on there and look forward to seeing it coming along. Okay. All right. I too vote uh, yes on departing. Okay. So I'll see. I'll see you guys on the inside some at some point. Very good. All right. Bye. Bye. Okay, so I make a directory voting. CD voting. I don't know if anybody's left. Um, and uh, now I want to I, I want to check out both these projects. Right. Uh, did I not save this yet? Um, I don't know what I just did. <laughs> Scare, scares me. Um, I didn't really want to do anything. Um, okay, so how do I, uh, so I do a cloner download here and I get an, I copy the address. This is our chain DBR. So I want to check out, I, I don't want to clone it, right? So I do a git, check out, I think. <laughs> we don't have any uh, expertise in, uh, oops. Okay. 
I mean, you're just in an empty directory, it's not even a Git directory. You can start by cloning voting the repository first, maybe. Well, that's separate. Loading, I, 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 I just wanted to check out this project so that I could copy the subdirectory into voting. Um, oh yeah, this is voting, but then it's, I'm going to have another voting within the voting. Um, yeah, I guess that was a mistake. To move to her voting. Now, I don't know why I can't, couldn't check this out. Do you know what's wrong with that? I mean, you can check out before it's uh, the folder is actually a Git folder. Because right now it's just an empty folder with no dot Git for. Uh, so I have to do a clone. Yeah, you have to clone or init. But I, you I usually like to clone. I, I, I files. I don't want to check it. I don't want. Don't want the. Uh, I don't want to clone it. But if 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 that's the only way I can get the files, then I do. I'll clone it. I know there's got to be another way to get the files without cloning. Because now I gotta, I, if I, if I, if I uh, want to copy some files from here into voting, that becomes a problem, doesn't it? Because I mean, you can start by cloning the voting repository, and then you can just uh, remote clone. It doesn't. It, yeah, it doesn't matter which which order I do it. I'm going to have them both there. Both. I guess it's copied. Um. Okay, so now I want to copy um, uh, no. So I want to copy the O2R directory from there to here. Then I want to go to voting. And I want to do a git add O2R. Do I have to? It apparently worked. <laughs> I got the uh, O2R directory into the voting project. It looks like. So let me try to uh, push it. Oh, commit. Uh, dash M. Um. Yeah. 
Discord. Oh, oh two, two, rev address. What? What do I do? It wants to know who I am, huh? How come it doesn't? You don't have Git config set up in here. Yeah, I, I don't understand why not. Oh, because I got a new machine? So, I mean, I got my hard disk replaced. Does that do it? Uh, yeah, that's going to explain it. Um, And uh, I mean, it's usually easier just to um, Just to create the .ssh file or whatever it is that does. Okay, and then I can push it. Oh no, Git Credential Manager for Windows. Oh, this works. I thought I switched this. True. Oh no, I, sw I, I thought I switched that to like Google. What is my password? Wonderful. How come I don't know my password for GitHub? That's all we need. I know something happened. I don't know why. Um, what? You, you, you misspelled it, Jim. I'm sorry. You mistyped. Let me try logging in here. Oh, I got it memorized. Is that correct? It's correct. Huh. You can change it. Let me just think. Let me try one more time.
aggregate exception. Oh well, I'm going to have to uh, um, Um, how do I do password? Oh, jeez. Open up and back here. Settings. Probably in security <laughs> tab. Choose a better password. Ugh. It just still didn't work. <laughs> oh no. We'll try logging in one more time. Looks good. I don't oh. know what that I don't know what that aggregate exception is though. That's weird. I wonder if I can have that every time I log in. Um, now I hope I remember my password. It didn't let me put in the old password. <laughs> um, did did your well, get probably why I didn't remember it was because I had to change it to something I didn't remember. All right, um, uh, so what do we have? We have uh, uh,
we have the uh, did the push work O2R here yeah successful so uh, and I'll put this in there this has a uh, read me I guess I should update that. This is Dan's code. I don't want people asking me about it. <laughs> um, so I'll put in here. Okay. So, um, I suppose it's easy enough to write a program that will generate a thousand random keys. And, sp and spam it <laughs> to oh. emails. I'm sorry? Is this what we're going to do, like eventually to kind of generate keys and then uh, send out all the... We have to have a list and then, then we have to email it. Um, Emailing it used to be pretty easy. Now you have to worry about your email. So um, we really want to be able to write a procedure that will dynamically select a random You know, email and a random and a ticket. Just select an email and generate a random key. Uh, uh, right? Yeah, and I guess, uh, uh, you know, we have to keep a list of the random key without uh, randomly. So they can't be linked back to the account. It was sent to. I mean, I could write a bash script that would do the, pick out a random key and send an email. Question is, uh, making the email so that Google doesn't think it's spam. Can we actually do something else rather than send the uh, like private keys to participants? Your, you to got members? an idea? I don't know, maybe like once, uh, like a one-time link that they use to generate uh, a private key out of that. I'm not sure. Well, it could be, uh, no, I, I mean, it could, it is the equivalent to a private key. I mean, I was thinking just, uh, but then we have, yeah, I was thinking of just a ticket. So we'd have a list of tickets and uh, only valid tickets could vote. And we publish what ticket voted which way, but not who holds the ticket. Mm -hmm. um. 
Can, do we uh, do we send them a receipt? of some sort, a proof well, that they voted? Well, you know, in order for the vote to be signed by the election account, rather than the, the user, we have to have an electric, electric app, app that's going to Ah, okay. Validate the ticket and submit the vote. I mean, you can just submit the vote. I mean, the block our chain, the contract can reject, will re, can reject invalid tickets. And, you know, the, I mean, there's a lot of ways it could be done. I mean, we could, it could be listening on each ticket name for a vote, but it might be more efficient just to uh, have a, uh, and I think it would be to have a, uh, a map of, uh, a map of the uh, tickets and the votes associated with the ticket. And uh, I guess you sort of need a global thing, like when the voting gets opened and when it gets closed and all that stuff. Who would have, who would be the admin? Somebody like Ian? Yeah. You know, I mean, ultimately we want everything to be um, um, Actually, that's what I wanted to talk to about today was uh, multi-sig. Uh, uh, was uh, uh, all promises. What is that? Uh, Dan re referred to all promises method. I basically waited until all the promises were fulfilled. Now, a read of the channel is the result on the channel is, you know, like a promise, right? You, a, a, a result is a promise or a listen is a promise? No, you, you're listening to a channel. Okay. So you call you call some function and you listen on a return channel. So when it's you know you, that's a promise that when the thing gets done executing, it's going to send a, a result to you in the return channel. Right. Okay, I think I follow. So that if you do a join, uh, promise one, promise two, promise three, promise four. then um, that's uh, 
all promises. Okay. Fulfilled. So, um, uh, the idea, I guess, is that uh, we each have a key. And when we use that key, that's fulfilling a promise. Oh, I got you. I, I, I see how it connects in with multisig now. But, you know, I guess what's troubling me is, you know, what, uh, you know, I can see, uh, you know, specific keys for specific purposes. And, you know, the transparency would have to be that, you know, well, we understand this contract that gave us each a key, right? So yeah. without knowing the other's key, And you know, what's the key? An unforgeable name, right? Oh boy. Well, guys, I'm surprised I'm still going. It's been a long day. <laughs> Can you also yeah. push uh, voting contracts from robot to, to this repository? Oh, yeah, well, uh, the voting problem is different right now. Okay, the, ro the robot voting was not anonymous. But it's going to be the, it's going to be a similar code, right? Based on this. Yeah, it could be. That's interesting, I guess. Uh, Yeah, we could um, it would be nice to update robot code to do to use uh, our chain identities. Problem is, is that if, if, unless if unless everyone runs their own robot, we have a problem with the private keys being shared is, is there uh there's not just some little module everybody could run that would keep them from having to run the whole robot I mean, ultimately, I, I I think everybody will be running something like robot, but I'm just thinking for the purpose of this this uh, pro this app. Yeah. Um, no, I, uh, I'm just thinking of uh, having uh, a Discord identity that doesn't have much of a wallet. In other words, how much do you trust Discord? <laughs> right here. A Discord identity. Maybe you, you know, you just have a few dollars worth of rev in it, and that's it. Ah. Uh. So, you know, there's not much incentive for people to break in or, you know, corrupt. I mean, if the robot gets corrupted. I kind of wish people could vote without. Uh... I kind of wish a chain kind of had some functionality to allow that developer to kind of pay upfront for the fees. It will make it a lot easier for people to vote without having ref, like on chain. Right now, like, all of why them can't we like, do that? need. We can't do that now. 
seems like we can, but we have to go through a like middleman that kind of votes for you and pays for transactions. That's kind well, of the. Now that's the. I mean, the problem is uh, that a, a middleman has to pay because if you pay, then you're no longer anonymous. By signing the transaction, you're exposing your identity. <coughs> mm -hmm. Now you're. Uh, So that's why we need an election app where you actually vote. It uses its rev to to uh, submit your vote, everybody's votes. Okay. So the end user doesn't need like a rev wallet with the ref with actual ref in order to vote. Right. But okay, now hoping, I'm with you. We're hoping at the same time. At the same time, I should put here requirements. Aha. Um, 10. Collect member information. Survey. Member survey. That's what we were going to do. Oh, I got two tens, huh? I forget it puts in the numbers for me. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, rev address. Okay. An email is a lousy identity. We get it. Yeah, I won't trust an email either. Like it could be like a puppet account. <laughs> Web address. Okay. Uh, Jim, have you ever heard of the concept called ring signatures? What? Ring? Ring. R-I-N-G signatures. Ring signatures. Yeah. This, this sounds related to what we're doing. Let me share a screen right quick. And the first thing they start talking, well, no, they, they start getting into these ring signatures that, I mean, this is old, old stuff. What's the title? What, what was the title of that? An effective and efficient and effective decentralized anonymous voting system. Ah. And this is on Ethereum, but these ring signatures, do, what do they do for us? Ring signature has the property that a signer in a particular group can sign the message as a group member and verifier cannot distinguish the identity of signer. We can simply take this method to make voters sign the ballot anonymously, but there will be another problem. Oh, I think it gets deeper. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll do some research. Um, I mean, there's ways with uh, with using um, the uh, what do you call it? The zero proofs, zero knowledge. For yeah, snarks, zk snarks. Um, but you still need an app to do it, you know. So uh, this is we don't need anything more complicated than this. This is very simple. Okay. They get a ticket to vote. That's it. <laughs> okay, I'll I'll buy that. And that's consistent with the object capability model. <laughs> All right. Um, but they, you know, the, the the caveat is is that it has to be done off chain because nothing on chain is private. You can't make it anonymous, truly anonymous on chain. No matter how we do it. <laughs> If they sign the, that's the, kind of unfortunate. Well, that's there, are there are ways to do it uh, like, right. uh, 
right. They can use a functional encryption, for example. Right. You can yeah, make voting and make it truly anonymous. Anonymous. Yeah, that's but what they're doing. It's not gonna run over. Sorry. Right. It's not right. gonna run on blockchain because it's not possible to put it in there. It's too complex of a process. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, oh well. So uh, the, uh, uh, I mean, that's something we can consider at a later time, but the, the uh, we, want, we want to get the member We want to get member information, and the, we at least need a rev address. Um, and uh, Discord. Um, okay, and uh, the uh, uh, we talked about uh, getting uh, uh, surveying them about you know their their uh, their uh, uh, their interests, whether it's. Uh, uh, Invest to build to uh, uh, I can't remember, you know, what they, what they are, but we, there's there's different. Uh, uh, build, uh, coordinate. I don't know what it is, but. Some kind of thing as to what 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 their interests are as an R chain member. Uh. So it's what. All of this is going to be like a soft launch of on-chain on governance, right? But uh, we can actually do all of this on on blockchain. Like, for example, add uh, like uh, yeah. I mean, it can uh, uh, be uh, we can uh, basically we're going to have a. Uh, uh, streaming tickets, uh, and then we, we have a uh, uh, map of uh, tickets. and uh, tickets. A oh, ticket. Map of ticket votes. Okay, but you're basically going to have a structure of how they voted on each question.
is that structure going to live on the air chain network or outside of it? I'm sorry, this would be on our chain. Okay. A person should be able to, to verify that their ticket re, uh, reflects the way that they voted. Nobody knows what ticket belongs to who, but you should be able to verify that um, uh, that your votes, that the votes for your tickets are, haven't been changed, haven't been uh, changed. In other words, if you voted for Bernie and uh, you see, look up your ticket and it's a vote for Trump, then you know that he fucked up, the, up with the election. And anybody can verify the totals because all the votes are there for all the tickets. Right? Mm -hmm. All right. Maybe I'll walk the dogs. Is everybody having good weather? You're on yeah. mute, Gary. I'm just, I'm just sitting home avoiding Corona. I yeah. don't care about the weather. Where are you again? I don't know why I keep forgetting. You're in Canada? No, I'm in Sweden. You're in Sweden. How come I, how, how can I forget that? I'm in Fort Worth and uh, debating turning the air conditioner on. Beautiful outside today. Hey, Charlotte has been putting the air conditioning on here. I, I, I've gotten a little more accustomed. You know, I mean, the weather hasn't bothered me at all. It's not, it's not that humid. Yeah, um, we, we get a you know, and uh, you know, this time of year, every day is just pretty beautiful. In the summer, even, riding my bike is fine. As soon as I stop, though, I want to die. The heat yeah. just hits me. <laughs> yeah, when I was a bike rider, I, I would go out on, on 100 degree days because I was, uh, I was such, I, I was moving so fast, you know, I always had a 15 mile an hour breeze on me. And right. So and, I, and you're sweating so that it, yeah. it keeps you cool. Yeah. Okay. It's not really an issue in Sweden. <laughs> The hottest weather is like 25 degrees. Uh, like it's already like catastrophically warm for most <laughs> wow. people. What's it here? It's 80 degrees Fahrenheit. What's that? Uh, um, 35, 35? Celsius? I don't know. I'm uh, about right. That's. I was going to see what the temperature is here today. It's been pretty steady, about 80 degrees here. What is uh It's 86 here now. Uh, 86. Thirty. That's, that's thirty degrees Celsius. We don't think that's in already, Celsius. That's already warm enough to like take baths and stuff. <laughs> but uh, it's not. It's the luxury weather you have, like. Here in Sweden, it's always cold. I didn't think I was going to like Florida because it's so hot. And then it has these sudden rainstorms out of nowhere. You get soaked. But it's it nice everything yeah, actually where I live. 
Not so many, not so many, uh, many, uh, I mean, it'll, it'll rain for a few, you know, we'll have a rain, a rain cloud will come over, we'll get some rain for, for a few minutes and then it's dry. Yeah, you know, you just, you just have to just stand under a tree for a minute. Not so bad. I wonder how it, how the weather affects the spread of coronavirus. Like probably the warmer it is, the more likely people are to go outside and like talk to each other. But if the weather is cold, like everyone has to sit at home and follow the instructions. Actually, actually, people are in combined spaces in the winter. In the in the summer, the the the, the virus uh, cycle cycle goes down. There's hardly anything in the summer. It's only in the fall that it starts again. We we hope that that's the case with coronavirus, Jim. We're not sure. We don't know that for a fact yet because we haven't been through a warm season with it yet. Right. It's, I mean, this this behavior is certainly going to stretch it out because um, it's going to take a long time for it to go through the population. That's true, but that's what they want. That, right. I, I think that's what we want because they, our... You know, the, uh, and, you know, it makes sense in the sense that the more you stretch it out, the more people are going to benefit ultimately from a vaccination. Yeah, or, or a treatment even. Or treatments. Right. And I've been, I, I haven't heard anybody talking about hyperbaric oxygen treatments. I, I think that's something they should try with these, these patients that they're losing, you know, combine that with the the intubation, and then see if that helps. But you never know. Those things cost about, you can get those for $10,000. The the hyperbaric bubbles you get in, you, you know, and. Yeah, I know what they are. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll see you all soon. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.